Good morning. Today is June 14, 1999. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. And continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project, this morning we're inter interviewing Clarence, better known as Bill Melanson. Good morning, Bill. How are you? Good morning. Very good. Thank you. If I could ask you a few background questions first. Do you mind my asking you how old you are? <laughs> no, not really. How old are you? 76. 76. And your current address? 5 Ranger Road. In Natick. Natick. Yep. And are you married? Married. And your wife's name? Dorothy. And do you have any children? I have three children. And any grandchildren? Three grandchildren. Three grandchildren. And where were you born? In Shediac, Canada. In Canada. New Brunswick province. And did you grow up there? I, I was seven years old when I came to the States. And what part of the States did you come to? Dorchester. Do Dorchester, Mass. Yeah. Why did you come from Canada to Dorchester? Because uh, my father had no work up there and he moved down here and brought the whole family down. And how many were in your family? Eleven. Eleven children? Yeah. You were one of eleven? Yeah. And it's, where were you in the uh, group? Probably three quarters. So what type of work did your dad get down in the Dorchester area? He was a bricklayer. And, he <laughs> and did he do brickwork down here? Yep. With different companies? Yeah, and then he opened his own construction company, and that's what he had up until he retired. Did you all work on the comp in the company with him? No, two brothers did. And while he was opening his company or working in that construction work. Your mom, what was she doing? She was home. She was taking home. care of the Take children? Children, yeah. What type of home did you have in Dorchester? We had a very uh, religious uh, home. My mother was very devout Catholic. And uh, one of the things my father instilled in us, don't ever lie. She said, if I ever catch you lying, <laughs> you're going to go across the wall. <laughs> so we remember that all the years. And uh, it's easier to tell the truth anyway. And you get caught up in a lie. You don't know what you said before. <laughs> sure. Now, with 11 children and two adults in the family, did you have a large home? Uh, we had a six-room home. We all lived together. Mm -hmm. Cozy? <laughs> Cozy and comfy, yeah. What do you remember most about growing up in such a large family? Uh, everybody was close. Uh, all the meals were home cooked because you couldn't afford to go out anywhere. We had a garden. My father had a garden, so we had fresh produce. My mother did the canning. I can remember all the canning she did. And uh, all. I always remember my grandfather coming down from Canada. And the first time I went to see a Red Sox game was one of his visits. And you remember and that? remember that, yeah. Did he about, go with you? I was about nine years old, yeah, him and I. Went in. That was about two years after I got here. Mm -hmm. It must have been exciting for you to remember yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, then going to school, I couldn't speak English. What was your native tongue? French. <coughs> Excuse me. And was French spoken in the home? Off and on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My mother and father spoke it all the time. They speak very good English, but they didn't want us to know what they were talking about. They thought. <laughs> <laughs> they talked uh, French. So at the age of seven, you come to Dorchester not speaking any English. What was it like going to school? We were uh, laughed at, ridiculed. Had a real tough time, mm -hmm. and eventually uh, we learned the language. And after that, it was all right. Do you remember anyone in your class or any teachers helping you specifically to learn English? Not really. I went to parochial school, St. Max, and the nuns are uh, the ones that taught us. And uh, that's where I learned the English, was in parochial school. Do you still have any French in your language? 
very little. I can converse a little bit, but not can too you much understand it? I can understand a lot of it. Yeah. How many brothers and how many sisters of the eleven? Seven brothers, four sisters. And how old were you when you made the decision, or was it your decision, to enter the military? Well, uh, it was on account of Pearl Harbor, really. And I couldn't get in right away, so I, in February of 43, I went in. How old were you? I was uh, just 19. Now, prior to entering the military, had you finished school? No. They allowed me to go into service, and I, when I finally get out, I received a war diploma, which I believe I have. With you. A copy here. Yeah. So uh, they gave that to me in '46, year after I got out of service. Did friends go in the service with you? Yeah, I had quite a few. You went in, but then after basic training, we all went our different ways. And what, what branch of service did you go into? I was in the uh, Army. Why did you consider the Army over another branch? I have no idea. <laughs> no blessed idea. <laughs> where was your basic training? Down in uh, Camp Croft. And where South, is that? South Carolina. And you were saying the main reason was because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Do you remember what what went through your mind or what your thoughts were when you heard that that had occurred? Well, at the time, uh, they have a Vine Street gym in Dorchester, and I was running around the perimeter. And uh, there was a library there, too, also. So the librarian almost fainted him. She had a radio on. So everybody stopped what they were doing, running and so forth. And that, that's when I heard about Tack and Pearl Harbor. And uh, it was sad, everybody, you know. Because everybody at that time, they all wanted to go in the service at that time. And, but it didn't work out for a lot of them. They just couldn't go in at that particular point in time. For what <clears throat> reasons? Why weren't they accepted right away? Was there such an influx or? Uh, sometimes they weren't uh, qualified as far as health reasons. They may have been needed at home to support their families. Mostly the married fellows, they wouldn't bring them in right away because they needed them for their family. And it was, uh, we had a lot of friendship that, you know, going in, but then like I told you, we separated. And uh, a lot of them got killed over there and we came back. Now, when you went into basic training, it was in North Carolina. South. South Carolina, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, was this your first time out of the Massachusetts area? Well, uh, that, that's the farthest I, I had, had been. ever been. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what it was like? It was, Not only basic training, but the area that you were in? Uh, the basic training was uh, tough. Uh, very, very uh, quick because they wanted to get us overseas fast. And uh, it was not a piece of cake, I can tell you. Really worked our buns off <laughs> to get through it. But uh, we got through it. Did you have any time off during your basic training that you could see the sites? We had uh, yeah, two, twice in three months. Do you remember anything in particular that sticks in your mind? Uh, not really. Just. Just to uh, get overseas, everybody wanted to get overseas, and mm -hmm. get in the war. During this time period, was there any specialty that sort of came up to the top that you were better in rather than other things in the service? Uh, the, only, the only thing would be on, uh, when I went to school, my major was printing, and uh, at the time, I was supposed to go to Washington, D.C., get on the, one of the papers for the Army, and they mixed up the records, so I ended up in the Army, and 
I checked it out, and they said, nothing you can do now. You're here. Forget about it. <laughs> so were you considered That's, Army infantry? Yeah, mm -hmm. at, at that time. What was your first duty station? Oh, in Africa. Do you remember leading up to that time? Were you able to come home to say goodbye to family? No. How, how quickly did we it left, happen? We left February and uh, May we were on the boat heading overseas. No furlough at home or anything. So February you went in, February yep. of 43, you yep. had your basic training and yep. then they shipped you out. Yep. And did you go by ship? Yep. What do you remember about that? It took us 30 days to get over there because uh, dodging the U-boats. And we went over on the uh, Ile de France, French ship, which was converted to uh, troops. And I might add, when I finally came home, we came back on the same ship. You did. So that was uh, very ironic, isn't it? That was ironic, yeah. yeah. What, what else about, was it crowded? Did you oh, have duties? Were you Very relaxing? crowded, very crowded. We did calisthenics. Uh, I slept up on deck most of the 30 days under a gun turret. Why? With a couple of guys downstairs. Too many people were sick. Mm -hmm. So I want to get away from them. and. So I ended up on, on deck most of the time. You mentioned earlier about <clears throat> trying to avoid the U-boats. Did you see them, or had you heard about them? No, they, uh, oh yeah, we knew all of them. They were out there. They were bombing ships going over, so you didn't know if you were going to make it anyway. Hold on, so. Did you see ships being bombed? Yeah. What was that like for a young 19-year-old? Just, just thinking out. It could happen to us. You, you never knew. Mm -hmm. Was there your, your life was not, you know, worth a nickel? Was there fear, <coughs> anxiety? I don't think so. I think you had your mind made up. If it was going to happen, it happened. So. While you were being, while you were on the ship. Were you with an actual unit, a group? Uh, not then. I was not attached to a unit then. Mm -hmm. Once you reached Africa. Overseas. Mm -hmm. I joined the 45th Division. So while you were on this ship, everybody? They were different. Going to go to different outfits. Once they get over the disembarkment in Africa, then they sent to the different divisions. What was the weather like on the ship? Uh, it wasn't too bad. We had, uh, I don't think we had any rain going over, but I'd say in the 70s. And the ocean was uh, rough at times, you know, which is why a lot of the people get sick. Once you arrived in Africa, what part of Africa do you remember that Casablanca. you... Casablanca. Casablanca, which has such a romantic sound to it yes. today because of the old movie. What, what was yeah. it like back then? Uh, it wasn't nice. Tell us about it. A lot of all it saw was bombed out areas, ships blown in the water, hospital ships blown up. That's what we saw when we came in. and. Uh, the, the uh, natives, they were just trying to get by, you know, whatever, they, any way they could. How did they respond to your arrival? Oh, they were, they were jubilous. Yeah, they were very happy to see us. Because the Germans you know, had been there, and they were out. So we came in, and we had to follow the, the Germans across Africa until we finally get them out. So when you first arrived, you arrive in Casablanca. This is now February, March. Yeah. What was what was the weather like? You said it was all bombed well, out. Well, we got so in there's... Africa. The temperature is about 120 during the day. And then at night, it went real cold. Was that a real adjustment for a lot of you? Well. 
it was terrible to, you know, to see all that stuff. Did you have the right equipment to handle the heat in the day and the cold at night? Not really, no. We had heavy uniforms and uh, did a lot of, a lot of sweating. The uh, olive drab shirts and pants, heavy, all heavy, heavy stuff. And uh, that was oppressive, the heat. The heat was terrible. And then seeing the bombed out areas, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were infantry, so there would be tanks, but there was all, also a lot of walking to be yeah. done, correct? Yeah, better believe it. So <laughs> what, bring us through a typical day in your unit. Well, what, what time of day would you be up in the morning? You could, you could be up three in the morning, four in the morning, depending on what you were going to do. And uh, wherever the Germans were, you were trying to get them out. So you'd go in force matches. Uh, they had maps, we had followed maps, anticipating where the Germans were. So uh, as far as our weapons, we had our weapons all ready for it. Mortars, machine guns, tanks, what have you. And what did you personally use? I had a machine gun. I was a machine gun, a heavy machine gun. So did you have to carry this equipment? Yeah, I had to carry the machine gun. And How heavy? Someone else carried the tripod. How heavy was the Probably gun? Probably with the water, 40, maybe 50 pounds. In 120 degree oh, heat? Yeah. And when you mention a forced march, how many miles? Oh, God, it could be 20, 30. And it wasn't like the crow flies. You may see your objective with your eye, and you say, oh, we'll make that in two hours. Maybe 15 hours later, you'd get there. What was the terrain like? Terrain was a lot of desert. A lot of sand dunes, uh, not much water. Uh, we met a lot of uh, the Arab so-called sheiks. They have probably eight or ten wives, and each one did certain jobs. And they had beautiful buildings where they lived. And uh, we got friendly with some of them. But uh, after a while, uh, they were getting ready to invade Sicily, and they, we went into amphibious landing uh, maneuvers, get ready for Sicily. So you would practice? Yeah, yeah, after, after we got through with the Germans. And how close would the Germans, the enemy, be? Uh, over to that wall, maybe, 20, 10, 15 feet away, maybe, some of them. So do you remember personally what it was like for you the first time you saw a German soldier? Well, he's out to kill me, and we, were, we had orders to kill, and so that's what you had to go by. And uh, you're more or less protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about if you did kill somebody, you're not thinking about it. Because he's, he could have killed you. And in North Africa, did you have many close calls? Not as, not as many as the other parts of my campaign. <coughs> Excuse me. So you mentioned Sicily, getting ready for Sicily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we invaded Sicily. And uh, that was uh, all walking. The whole, the whole island it took us 38 days. Now, how did you get from North Africa to Sicily? We had a boat, a big ship. How long were you then on we that had, boat? Oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe a couple of days. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. that a, a time for you to sort of rest, gear up? Well, I mean, what were you up, going through? Yeah, you had to gear up for you. You encounter in Sicily, which we didn't know what what we're gonna, ha you know, what was gonna happen. So, 
you were three months in basic, yep. you were on the ship, you went yep. to Africa. How yep. long were you in Africa? Uh, probably two months. Two Three, months. Two months so. And it was constant? Yeah, just moving all the time. Yeah. And the Germans kept pulling back, pulling back. And finally, the city, they pulled out. <coughs> Excuse me. And they were in Sicily then, so. Prior to them pulling out and prior to your getting ready for Sicily, were there other units from other areas of the world that you would meet up with also? Yeah. Such oh, yeah. as? Yeah, there was 3rd Division, 34, 36. Now what divisions are they from? They're from the infantry. They're, they were with the same army we were with, 7th mm -hmm. Army at the time. What about any of the British or any of the Australians? Any well, of they them? had their units, but they Did kept they kept to themselves. They had their area to take over and we had our area. Mm -hmm. So you really didn't mingle with them? We didn't mingle with them. Too we mingled, but not as far as uh, combat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing I can remember uh, about them, they have to have their tea. So every afternoon about 3 o'clock, they'd, the, they'd stop whatever they're doing and have a fire and heat up their tea. So even in the midst of war, oh, yeah, they stop. would stop yeah, for tea? They yeah, the tea. Yeah. Did you join them? No, no. We, we just watched them, could see them. Because we weren't that far away from them. We were all pretty close. Sure. So then after a few months, you're getting ready. Did you know ahead of time that you were going to be going to Sicily? Yeah. How did you all feel about that? Well, it's something you had to do. I never, never had any feelings, really. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Germans were there, and they, they told us they had, we had to get them out. So you're on your ship for a while, and where did you land? Uh, in, uh, I forget the name of the town. We didn't have any opposition we got on that beach. We're you landed fortunate. on a beach? Yeah, we were very fortunate. And was there a drastic change in climate, or was it very similar? It was different than Africa, yeah. It wasn't as hot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did mostly walking. We did very little driving. In the During this time, were any of your um, other Army buddies did they fall into illness, or some, did the heat affect them in any way at all? No, no we, were, we were all in the same boat. So some probably got affected more than others, but basically we were all. What, what would you have to combat the heat? Did well, we took a lot of tablets, took a lot of adamant tablets, and uh, because you sweated so profusely. And did you drink a lot of water? A, yeah, a lot of hot water. Hot water. <laughs> Couldn't keep it cold. No, and uh, we had list, what they call Lister bags of water. Probably held uh, probably a couple hundred gallons of water. And would so, they be on a truck? or? They'd be on the ground, on the, ground, on the tripod. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a little spigot. So you go over there with your little canteen and fill the canteen up with the water, hot and, water. <laughs> and then what would you eat? Oh, the meals. <laughs> we had uh, C rations and uh, K rations. Explain those to us. Uh, the K rations came in a uh, waterproof box about eight inches long and maybe a couple of inches thick. And uh, that usually could have had uh, a can of uh, eggs and ham, all chopped up, and a biscuit maybe, and a little tin of coffee, uh, and uh, two cigarettes. So they had the breakfast, and then they had for lunch, it probably had uh, some kind of meat in the cans. Did you know what it was? Not until you opened it up. <laughs> And uh, you had to eat that mostly cold, because you couldn't light fires, naturally. 
and uh, most of the food was eaten cold unless you had uh, gone back to the rear and had some hot food. Like the quartermaster, they, they took care of the food for you. And once in a while, in the middle of action, you could go back and have a hot meal, which was very rare. But uh, we all survived the meals. And, uh, the sea rations, the tanks carried the sea rations. And they were cans of beef stew, chili con carne, how else are some of the others? <laughs> there were so many different ones, you know. And uh, they had biscuits that were hard as a rock. You had to have good teeth to <laughs> break them. <laughs> Did all of you smoke yeah. back then? Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I started when I went in the service. You started smoking in the service? Yeah. And when did you quit? Uh, 59, like, probably uh, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. So you're in that Sicily. Yeah. Tell us about that. Sicily was uh, up and down hills and a lot of skirmishes with the Germans, naturally. And the problem was they knew where we were because they just left that area. But we didn't know where they were, and that was always a problem through the whole war. It, was, it wasn't just Sicily. And uh, Patton says, well, by golly, I'm not going to wait for the British. We were supposed to wait for the British and line up with them and then go in together. And we went around this uh, Mount Etna, which is a volcanic thing. So we went around there, came into Palermo. While we were there, somebody says, well, what about the British? They were supposed to go in with us. So when they finally came in, they, we were there already. And we just bypassed. And we caught pockets of Germans, thousands and thousands. They just they got nowhere to go. So they had people below them, people above them. They just gave up and uh, would they God, surrender to you? Yeah, oh yeah. And in surrendering, did they all then make it to a camp, or yeah. were some of them yeah, killed? Yeah, they sent them to a camp. Some some came over here, this country. Mm -hmm. Some sent them here, and they had big camps over there for them. And uh, but then uh, that was over. You know, Sicily was over, and we rested for a couple of weeks. Where did you rest? Did you have actual time? No, just out in the field just somewhere. Just in the field. Out in the field, in the tents. And, and uh, we had uh, a couple of weeks rest and re what they call R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. And then I think two weeks after that, we got ready to invade France. I mean, I'm sorry, Italy, the boot of Italy. Now, did you go by tank at that point, or truck? How did, how no, did from, uh, from Sicily? <coughs> from Sicily to Italy, we went by boat. You went by boat. <coughs> yeah, can went tell by my, boat. My geography isn't all that well, yeah. I apologize. Um, so again, now this is your third invasion for yeah. you. Um, where did you land in Italy? Uh, Salerno down by called Salerno mm -hmm. on the west coast. We're down near the boot. And how many would, would be in, involved in this invasion? Mm. Probably 50,000. When you landed, was it, again, rough terrain, easy beach area? Tell us about what it was like. No, we had to go up a hill, up a uh, like a cliff. Did you get, um, was it a safe area? Was it an area that had already been uh, invaded by the Germans? Were they there waiting for you? Oh, they were, yeah, they were waiting for us. Tell us about that. Yeah, what that was, was that like? That was terrible. They were just shooting down our throats, trying to get off the boats. 
We had little landing crafts, that's how we came in. Now would these be the flat bottom crafts? Yep. And how many would be in one of those? God, my recollection, uh, maybe 50, 50 to 100, depending on the size, plus all your equipment. And you're, you're coming up onto a beach area and you're hearing, what were you hearing? Well, hearing gunfire plus shells all around you. One, one barge blew right up next to us, killed everybody on it. So we're saying, well, we could be the next. So you just, you know, go along and hope you make it. And, uh, it's never fun. I just, you know, it's hard to even think about it. But you can't figure out, you know, why these things happen, why one boat get blown up and another one don't. Mm -hmm. And, and then, so you scramble off of this flat bottom boat. Yeah, up onto the... And you're in the water. Yeah, we're in the water probably four feet. Then we get up into the land, we have to go up a hill and get up there best we can. At this point in time, are you carrying the machine gun then too? Yeah, carrying the machine gun and everybody's carrying the ammunition. I had, uh, I had like maybe eight guys carrying ammunition boxes to them, plus their rifles and backpack. So it was a lot of weight to be you know, carrying around. Would you eight or nine people stay together a lot? Was that sort of your subgroup? Yeah, that was the one group. We stayed together in combat. Yeah. Well, because you you train together, so you work together and. Right. You know each other, you know what each other can do, and you're comfortable with them. Did you ever get a sense that this was more of the same? I mean, what, um, what was it like for all of you being so young and to continually, continually, continually be faced yeah. with death and combat right in front of you? Well, we were told beforehand that uh, a lot of you aren't coming back, so that's what we were told. So. If you got it, if you got it, you got it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people didn't make it. A lot of people mm -hmm. made it. So once you got up this hill, how long were you in Sicily, and what what were you faced well, with on Sicily, a daily basis? Uh, you were talking Italy. Salerno. I'm sorry, Italy, right? Well, we were there quite a while. We went up. Uh, we stayed there. So we uh, made the invasion of Anzio. We had another invasion up there. And that was, uh, that was full scale. That was a big scale operation. And you were a part of that? Yeah, yeah. And it again... It was the 45th, all the same division. Mm -hmm. while, while you're going towards Anzio, are you hearing ahead of time what to expect? Yeah. What would, oh, yeah. How, how would you hear this? I, I mean... Well, there's shells, and like I said before, there's shells all around you. Machine guns, mortars. They're just shooting, shooting at you. Keep you from coming on the beach. And that... Uh, you never really had uh, time to think about whether you're going to make it or not, because you had a job to do. And uh, it was just terrible for people uh, not to make it. You'd look around and... Did any of your friends, like this core group of nine, get... Um, yeah. And yeah. they were friends yeah. of yours? They were all wiped out. All and of Eventually, them. all got wiped out. Except you? Yeah, I was still living. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. That was a later. That was later in France that this happened. <clears throat> but up in Angio was uh, that was a tough one up there. We were there three, four months, and uh, I got I got wounded up there the first time, and uh, we had just taken the position the Germans held, and. Uh, so I don't know, about four hours later, they came back counterattacked. 
and uh, that's where I got my silver star. Where were you wounded? I got wounded in the, in the hand, in the eye, the hand, the arm, uh, my leg. I got shot in the leg. So what they did, they gave us a barrage of mortars. <coughs> Excuse me. So the shrapnel just tore into everybody, not only me. <coughs> so uh, they wanted me to go back. I said, oh, I'm not going back. Back to not a hospital, German, you mean? Not when the Germans are coming right at us. They were coming right at us. So I stayed at the gun for four hours. And you were wounded in all of these yeah, areas and you stay, continued stay. to stay at the gun? <coughs> yeah, that's what you read it in the Silver Star citation there. Would you like to show well, your medal? You have it here, I know. Yeah. Oh. This one here is the Silver Star. Mm -hmm. And the other one? And the other one here is a Purple Heart. And I have an oak leaf cluster to go with that. And explain that. <clears throat> and that is uh, the second wounds received in combat, and uh, that was in France. Prior but to your <coughs> second wound, so you're now in Italy, you're wounded. Is, an angel. Did, did yeah. a medic help you at least wrap you up, tape you yeah, up? Yeah, he taped me up, and then I, then I uh, after it was all over, about midnight, uh, then they sent me down to the hospital and I had the surgery to see it was all split open here and I was cut up in here and here and I was shot in the leg and so you know, I got all straightened out on that. So once I got straightened out there, I was in the hospital about a month. So I got back, they sent me back to my outfit. So my outfits pulled out of Angel and they were down in Naples and they were getting ready to invade France, just below Normandy. Normandy was the first invasion in June. Well, and we, you went, weren't we went in August. You August went in, in August. Yeah. Okay. And we were to link up with the ones from Normandy, which we did later. <coughs> but, uh, so you had heard ahead of time about the devastation in Normandy. Oh, God, yeah. Did you get newspapers? Did you yeah. just stars and stripes? Stars and stripes. Yeah. And were they really blunt about yeah, what was they're, happening? They're the pictures, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. They'd show pictures and the towns, towns were annihilated, just completely demolished. During this period of time, whether it be in Sicily, Italy, or the Normandy area, did you see any of the villagers? Yes. Oh yeah. Every time we went, every time we took. We, we probably, I probably was involved in, I'd say 200 towns in Europe, in our career that we took over. And where and did, where did these townspeople go when? They had caves and holes dug in the ground with, with four and five pieces of timber over it. So a bomb could hit there and it wouldn't, by them. So a lot of them went away from the city into the hills, get away from the bombing. And uh, if they stayed in the city, they weren't going to live in all the kind of all the bombing. But they were all receptive, uh, you know, all the people that we met. They were very happy to see us. As an aside, uh, and we'll get back to this, but have you been back to Europe at all? No, I have not. You've no. never gone back? No. Have you any desire to go back at all? No, I thought I did at one time, but now it's too late. I had, I had a family I stayed with in Malzeville, France. We had just taken the town, and then we lost it. And I, did, I lost, what did I do, I forgot where my outfit was and I couldn't get back. <clears throat> so this family took me in, a uh, family by the name of Lalonde. And they hid me up in their attic for two weeks. And uh, 
I look out the window and the Germans are walking all around the town. I, boy, oh boy, I says, how did I get in this mess? <laughs> but anyway, the GIs came back and took over the town. So when they did, I came down. And they all thought I got killed. You know, they didn't know I was still, still alive. alive. <laughs> now, did your French help you at that time? You came from a French-speaking French, family? Yeah, yeah, I could talk a lot of French then, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Have you ever corresponded with that family? I sent letters, but never uh, got any replies. Yeah. So they basically saved your life? Yeah. They, you know, that one episode there. Tell us more about um, your situation in France. Well, we, we went through France pretty quick. Uh, I really got wounded real bad was uh, you could see the Rhine River. Next morning we were supposed to be in Germany, so we're way up and high up in a hill. We were looking down in this town and we were shooting down at the Germans. And all of a sudden they lit in a barrage of mortar fire and a uh, bunch of the guys all around me got killed. And I got, uh, I got shrapnel through my stomach. I had to hold, hold my guts in. The, uh, I heard when they were taking me back, one of the guys, I saw Melanson's all through those stomach wounds. They never make it. So uh, I'm laying there thinking of that, you know, and I had no pain. So finally get back to the hospital, on the field hospital. How far away would that be from where field you were? Hospital maybe 10 miles, mm -hmm. so. but it was tents. They were just tents, and, but they had an operating room. Were they considered like a MASH unit like we know yes, of today? Yes, like a MASH unit, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they sewed me up and so forth. And the doctor that did it, he came from Dorchester, and he was the one that gave me my first vaccination when I was a child. Really? Dr. McMillan, yeah. So that was quite an oddity there. Did you know each other? Did yeah. you remember? Yeah, he knew, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so uh, then they flew me back to uh, Naples in the hospital there, and I was in the hospital for four months uh, with a colostomy. In the base of my spine, there's a hole about size of a silver dollar. Even and today? If it was a thousandth of an inch up, I would have been a paraplegic. Yeah, even today. Well, it's covered with skin, but it's not that big around. And then I'm all sewed up in here, I got stitches all over. So uh, that was rough. That was rough going. I had penicillin around the clock for four months, every three hours. I had blood transfusions twice a day for at least probably about three months. And uh, they never knew whether I was going to make it or not. And I must have had the last rites probably ten times <laughs> while I was in there. Now, did your family know how severe your wounds were? Yeah, they, they got notification from the town. The only problem was my father was walking down the street and guy came up, oh, Harry, sorry to hear about your son. I says, what do you mean? He says, well, I read it in the Boston Post. You got killed. You got killed. Father says, no, he's seriously wounded, but he's still alive. So they had put down that I got killed in action. Oh, my. So that was a funny, well, it was kind of humorous after you thought of it, you know. But, uh, that, I never went into combat after that, after I got those injuries. You didn't? No, no, couldn't go back. What was it like for you knowing that as severely wounded as you were, all of your buddies, as you mentioned, yeah. didn't make it? Yeah. It's tough. It's tough, yeah, just tough. Tough knowing your buddies out there. You were, you one minute you're talking to someone, next you look over and they're, they're dead. Did Could you ever? You converse with their families? Yes. Was that difficult for yeah. you? Yeah. 
Did you go? Did, did you speak to them or did you write to them? How did you? Well, a couple I went to visit, and then uh, the others I wrote letters and told them best I could. And uh, a lot of people appreciated that. You know that at least they knew how their son died. <coughs> but it wasn't a piece of cake, that's for sure. You mentioned earlier uh, General Patton. Had, had he always been off to the side making these decisions? Was he a part of your group? You, you Were know, you involved with oh, him? He'd, he'd, you'd see him come right up the road. You'd see him right up the road. And what was the sense, what was the feeling about him and other generals? Well, he was just a tough general. We had, I was under him and Mark Clark was under him. And he was different than Ghost Patton. He might have been looking for glory, I'm not sure, but uh, he was a good fighting general. I mean, he knew how to get things done. So uh, we had no problem with that. And then I, then I joined up uh, in Italy with uh, Mark Clark. He took over. And uh, didn't see much of him. Only saw him once or twice, General Clark. Did you befriend those who were your, your direct commanding officers? Uh, now, what, what way do you mean? That? Like a lieutenants or? Those, those guys in the last line. They didn't? Lieutenants, no. They, they were getting killed every day. They couldn't bring up enough of them. Because they were back and forth. You know, if you had a line, you, they were back and forth making sure everything was right. And they were target, so they were getting shot. Is there ever a sense or a feeling, whether you verbalized it or not, why am I here? Never, never, never thought of that. You go crazy if you if you thought that way. Now we Angio, we spent four months there. That was in Foxholes. All the time we were there. What That's was? That's you lived in Foxholes. So you each day and night you would be in a foxhole. You couldn't eat. You couldn't eat till at night because you couldn't sit up. If you sat up during the day, you you wouldn't make it. <laughs> you had to stay flat in the foxhole and get up. During the night. Was the so weather was tough. tough for you also during that time? It had a lot of rain, a lot of rain. So along with the foxhole, you'd yeah, be the rain in would be in war, mud. Mud. With all the other guys, so <laughs> you weren't the only one. Mm -hmm. But it did uh, did give a lot of people. Uh, uh, the illnesses that they have today, arthritis, rheumatoid, whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that can be attributed to laying in them foxholes for so long, damp weather, what have you. Now you had mentioned that after four months in the hospital, yep. <clears throat> you did not go back into combat. No, nope, nope. What did you do? I got attached to the 7th Army headquarters. Where was that? Mannheim, Germany. So from Italy, you went France, to France, then to yeah, Germany. Yeah, me and I, yeah. What was that like? That was uh, it was just a headquarters company, <clears throat> and uh, they made me a courier. And I used to go to Heidelberg. I don't know if you've heard of Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. Twice a day, delivering mail and dispatches. How would you get there? Jeep. Were you ever under fire? No, no. Germans were already beyond there. They declared Heidelberg an open city. They, we never shot, never fired a shot in Heidelberg. How was your health at that point? Well, I couldn't lift things. I couldn't stretch on account of the injuries I had in my stomach. And I had a lot of trouble with the bowels, naturally. With, you know, that, that type of injury. Did you, do you mind my asking, did you have a permanent colostomy? No, 
It well, was temporary. Four months. Mm -hmm. So it was reversed after reversed four months. Reversed after four months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you have had the option to come home at that point? Uh, no, they you you got to come home. You have to come home when they tell you. So uh, I should have come home because I was uh, disabled. But they put me in that outfit, and that's where I stayed till I uh, came home. And how long were you with, was it the 7th Army, is that what you said? Yeah, the headquarters there. How long were you with them? I was there uh, probably, uh, probably four months up to September 45. Looking back on your medical situation, do you feel that you got really good medical care? Uh, yeah, I think it, uh, at that time it's the best that they had available, and uh, I was in the hospital there with the nuns in Naples. Uh, they run, they run the hospital, and that was very nice. They very nice to us. And did they speak French at that they, point? No, no, that was that was in Italy. I'm sorry. Right. They. Uh, they spoke English, most of the nuns. So, correct me then, the four months that you were in the hospital was in Naples. Yeah, right. During your severe injury. Yeah, okay. looking at Mount Vesuvius every day. <laughs> I had a bed and there I was looking at that mountain. <laughs> Do you remember any of the other people that were in the hospital with you at that point in time? Yeah, I remember uh, George Holmes, who I grew up with him. And, uh, in Dorchester, you grew up with him? Yeah. So he came in with uh, frozen feet. And his feet, I would say, was twice the size of normal. And they put him in the <coughs> bed next to me. So uh, they sent him back to the States. And when I finally get out, I saw him. He's in a uniform, policeman's uniform. I said, George, what the hell is this? Because he's getting disability for his feet. He says, I joined him, and they said I was all right. So I said, boy, oh boy, are you lucky stiff. So, so they, about, yeah. they allowed him to come home. Yeah. And yet you had severe abdominal yeah, wounds and, I and had you, to stay. you had to stay. I had no reason, I had no idea why. And I have a brother that was in the 8th Air Force at the time, and he came home before me. So I, there was no rhyme or reason for it. Now where did George get his injuries with... with uh, he got his in France where I, where I did. Now would it have been because of the weather and the cold? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the weather, yeah, there was, we were up near the mountains and a lot of people got frozen feet. I, my feet, I got frozen too. So, it's so like 20 below zero up in the mountains and we didn't have the proper equipment. So a lot of, a lot of uh, soldiers did get frostbite. What do you think uh, were some He finally got killed anyway, uh, about 15 years ago. He was downtown Washington Street and the jeweler's building, I don't know if you know where that is, 333 Washington Street. Uh, there was a holdup and the people were coming out and he was in civilian clothes. And he said to them, stop, I'm a police officer. They just turned around and shot him, just killed him right there. And he went all through combat, you know, three years of combat to come back and get killed by people who are robbing a, you know, the jewelry store there. It was sad, that was a, I have to say that's probably one of the biggest funerals I had ever gone to. The George. lines were at least two miles on Dudley Street, Roxbury. Mm -hmm. Police, Police from all over the state were there. It was just a tragedy. 
Very emotional, I'm it was. sure. Yeah. Looking back, once you were finished in Germany with the Seventh Army headquarters, yeah. you said you were there for four months. Yeah. At that point in time, then, did you come home? Yeah. What was it went like? Over the, went over to uh, get on that ship, Ile de France, and the same ship, which I was surprised. <laughs> did you ever get a sense that you had a lot of luck? No. Well, I think it's mostly prayers. People did a lot of praying. You said you grew up in a religious yeah. family. You feel that that might have helped you? Yep. Yeah. What do you feel were some of your greatest challenges? I mean, certainly we've heard them, but what do you feel were some of the greatest challenges while you were in combat? Well, <clears throat> I have to think back. I don't The big challenge to me, I think, was uh, killing the enemy. And uh, I'd say up in Angio, uh, the captain said uh, I probably killed over 200 Germans. But, you know, they were coming in to kill you, so. But you don't think, you know, you don't think of that at the time. But beforehand, that's, said, geez, will I be able to kill anybody? And they taught us, kill or be killed. And that was the way you had to look at it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, being a religious person, uh, I never believed in any of that, so it was tough. During that time, did you have chaplains available to yes, you? Yes, we did, yeah. Were they helpful? Chaplains told us, uh, you know, that it's not your fault that you're not murdering anybody in the eyes of God. So uh, they were good, yeah, they were good. Yeah. They helped a lot. Like up in the NGO, we, at one point, uh, they were having mass about four miles away. So all the way, we had to get into a creek, walk the four miles of water up to your, I'd say up to your chest, because the Germans are watching. You couldn't have your head over the creek. So there's a guy, one of my buddies uh, in the foxhole, guy from uh, Hurdle Mills, North Carolina. He said, I'll go with you. I said, okay. And he's not even a Catholic. So we go down, we finally get there, and it's raining, pouring buckets while we're coming down. We get down there, the priest says, no, it's raining too hard, we're not gonna have the mass. I was ready to strangle him. <laughs> he said, look it, he said, if you don't do anything at all the rest of your life, you're going right to heaven. <laughs> he said, this is, he said, boy. And they wrote it up in stars and stripes. <laughs> Thought it. He put it in, I guess. Yeah. So this guy came back with me and he said, gee, he said, boy, you got to have a lot of faith. I says, well, we don't go to Mass. I said, we're supposed to go to Mass. And uh, D.L. White is his name, and he come from uh, South Carolina, like I told you, and he is now a uh, funeral director. So I've kept touch with him off and on. You have. And he's still around. He's my age. Are there others that you've kept in touch with? Uh, no, I've lost touch. Mm -hmm. We're in touch, and then either I stop or they stop contacting us. There's, there's one guy in uh, Somerville who I was friendly with, but he's never bothered to get back to me. But outside of that, uh, after the war, I would just come home and you know, try to gather yourself and get back to civilian life. Was it difficult? Well, yeah, it was 
Well, I still had a job. I worked for uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance Company, so they guarantee your job. You get back. So when I got back, I couldn't do the work I was doing account of my war injuries. So they gave me a, another job, which I took. And uh, it, it was uh, tough to get back to work and everything, because you're thinking at that time about your combat experience. Oh, it's uh, just a tough thing, anybody to go through combat. Did you have what they call flashbacks? Many. Many? Even today. Even today. How old were you when you returned to civil life, civilian life? 22. 22 years old. Yep. Um, at what point did you meet and marry? That was uh, 55, married in 56. We're still married today, 43 years later. Did you stay on with Liberty Mutual? Uh, I stayed with them for uh, probably five years. Then I went up to Maine, bought into a newspaper in Maine. and uh, They had a print shop. So I spent uh, five years up there. Then I came back and got my degree, Bryant Stratton. And that's I, after that, I met Dottie, you know, my wife. So uh, basically, since that time, uh, I've been just living from day to day. And, when did you, you settle know, in Natick? Uh, 48? Mm -hmm. No, 58. 58, yeah, after I, you got married? Right, yeah. 58. Did you <clears throat> go to school on the GI Bill? Yep. And what about purchasing a home? Did that help you yeah. also? Yeah, FHA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where were you discharged from, actually? Fort Devens. In all of your experiences, do you remember anything that was humorous? You just had such an unbelievable track. Oh, yeah, yeah. Excuse me a minute. Yeah, uh, right after basic training, so the Captain Trumbull had us all lined up. He says, now, he said, you guys are all through. You're going to be going overseas. He says, now, is there anything anybody wants to say or do before they leave? So I had a friend by the name of Lowenstein. And he said, Captain, he said, yeah, I'd like to do something. He said, yeah, you can do whatever you want. He said, he walked over the corporal that was a <laughs> guy training us, and he was a son of a gun. Nobody liked him at all. Well, he hauled off and caught him, laid him right out on the floor. So the captain says, is that all? Said, yep, it's okay, guys, dismissed. <laughs> and that was, that was kind of comical. Yeah. The other comical thing was, I was in the, up in Mannheim, Germany, and I was having trouble with my feet, because my feet get frozen. <coughs> so I asked Hicks here, one of the guys who was with me, I said, where the hell's the foot doctor? He said, oh, Dr. So-and-so, go see him. So I get in the room, and he said, get up in the chair, and I'll be right with you. So I'm sitting in the chair and I'm taking my boots off and stuff so you can see the feet. And then I look up and I see an eye chart. I said, what the hell is that doing in here? <clears throat> so I thought I was seeing a podiatrist. <laughs> so anyway, he comes back and he puts a thing on my eye here and he said, can I read? Oh, okay. And he puts the other one. I says, what the hell? He said, you're 2020. He says, well, I wasn't in here for my eyes. So he looked. He, I said, what do you think I got my boots off for? He said, I don't know. Man. He said, I came in for frozen feet. He said, well, I don't want to say anything because we get a lot of cooks that come in, you know, different things. He said, who sent you in? He said, Hicks. 
he said, oh, okay. He's the joker of the group. And so that was that He was sent funny. you to the wrong doctor? Yeah, yeah. Intentionally? Yeah, yeah. And the other funny one was uh, comical regarding uh, Joey Brown. He was a comedian years ago. <clears throat> so I was walking from the hospital to the mess hall outside. And I had my left arm from injuries up in the cast here. I was limping on my right leg because I had just had those shot in the leg. <clears throat> and I'm walking along and all of a sudden something hits me in the eye. So I go into, there was an eye doctor there. I go in and, geez, I got a piece of magnet and there was a piece of steel got in my eye, blowing in the wind. So he put a patch on the eye. So we get into the restaurant, cafeteria like, and uh, Joey Brown was in there. So I get in line and he puts his tray. You don't mind if I put my tray up here, do you? <laughs> and he says, he looks so, he's, he's crying out loud. He said, no wonder we can't get spam. You guys got it. So <laughs> we had more spam there than you could choke, you know. It's, well, that was comical. He, he was a funny guy. So, so that was pretty, once you also getting getting pushing forward a little bit, and you settled in Natick. Did you stay in the newspaper business, printing business? No, no. I came back, got my degree, mm -hmm. and I met Dottie, and then we got married. And then, what did you do f to support your family? How, what did what type of work did you do then? Uh, the GI Bill uh, took care of it. I got paid so much a month, plus they paid, you know, the college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a part-time job. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so then after that, I, I became an accountant and uh, worked for this company in Lynn. Mm -hmm. And uh, about two years after, I became their controller. And I stayed there 30 years till I retired. And uh, that's how I am today. I'm retired. And <laughs> retired uh, 1981, 91. Did you get involved in any veterans organizations? Uh, VFW, DAV. And you're still involved with them today? Well, I'm a member, I'm not involved. I'm not doing any work for them. But you did in the past? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How important do you feel it was serving in the military? And a second part <coughs> of that question is, how do you feel it affected the rest of your life? I feel that if we weren't over there, they would have been over here in this country. So in that respect, I didn't feel too bad you know, about uh, going over there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> People in this country, they don't realize the horrors of war. England, we're on a bus. This was a sad thing. And one of the uh, bombs came over. There was a bus in front of us, and a bomb hit the bus. And you saw Lord that? Would be right in front of us. <coughs> and that shook the hell out of me. I said, boy. So, uh, you come back, you, you don't know why you came back. You know, there's so many are still you know, over there that never made it. How do you feel it affected the rest of your life, having been in the military? Yeah. I don't think it really affected the rest of my life that much, uh, except to wonder why we have wars. I still don't know, except to keep anybody from over there coming over here. Uh, outside of that, I, I have no other thoughts on it. One of the questions that we ask a number of our veterans, and I'd like to ask this of you now, 
is how you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding veterans who served during your time, World War II, versus the Korean conflict and Vietnam War? Yeah, I think the uh, civilian population was <coughs> very, uh, well, they weren't receptive to the people coming back. From which generation are you talking? All of them, mm -hmm. even when I came back, it was, you know, just, well, you're just another guy. That was the attitude they had. It didn't mean anything to them. And uh, <clears throat> if people could only realize if you don't take care of uh, the situations that go around in the world, they could escalate over here to this country. And our buildings could be bombed and so forth. So in that respect, <clears throat> I think we have to maintain a strong defense because uh, if you don't, you're asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is, wars aren't run by generals and so forth. They're run by politicians. They're the ones that tell you if you can go to war, come home, and so forth. So sometimes <clears throat> are you saying that the decision makers they're the ones that would be responsible. Mm -hmm. Is there one thought, comment, or memory you'd like to share with us now to leave for not only your family, but for those in the community and elsewhere who might be viewing this tape in the future? Uh, I'd just like, <coughs> excuse me, like to say that I was uh, proud to serve my country. I know I have a wife and children here <clears throat> excuse me, that I'm still here because I serve my country and also other people who serve their country. I would recommend to anybody thinking about going into service, think very hard. I would say to them, get their education first. Mm -hmm. Then if they want to go in for you, <clears throat> excuse me, a year or two uh, in a service, that would be all right. But I can't see <clears throat> people just going into service for uh, no reason at all. So outside of that, that's all I have to say. Bill, would like to thank you this morning for giving us quite an insightful memory of your experiences and those of your buddies. We'd like to thank you again for all of your help. Okay. Yeah, it was tough. Stay right there. <laughs>